And I think, Julie, you have been at the heart of a lot of the innovation and development from the lab side, responding across all of our different types of hospitals. Um, we are utterly delighted you are able to be with us today. And if I thank you, Chris, and hand over to Julie, um, really, you need so little in the way. <laughs> of introduction. Thank you, Heidi. <laughs> um, it has been a lifetime of service to the transfusion community. But Julie Staves, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I, I'm delighted to actually be be here today. There was there was a fair chance that I wasn't actually going to make it, but anyway, I'm here today. So uh, Fats asked me if I would talk about laboratory planning within major incidents. Uh, next slide, please, Fats. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about writing a laboratory major incident plan, which is obviously quite essential. A bit about staffing. There's very much a temptation of your staff all wanting to come in and help. Get that. But actually, we probably don't need that on most occasions. A little bit about stock, because we could very much clear <laughs> the NHSBT of stock if we needed to. Some samples, a little bit about comms, and then about um, the continued impact in the laboratory, because our... And the end of a major incident for us is not the end when, you know, it's all happened in ED and it's all been postponed. It carries on for us. So and then I also want to just talk about checking staff and debriefing, just as Chris mentioned. So next slide, please. Fats. So uh, a little bit about writing a major incident plan. So. You need to make it in line to, with the overall trust policy. I've got a little bit within the trust policy uh, for you know, the clinical teams to read, to understand what, what our role is and about what we would likely to do. And then I've got a more detailed plan, which sits within the laboratory. The emergency planning department is very much aware of them. Um, of what's in our plan and they agree they don't need the whole plan within the big plan because like Chris said ours I think is 200 and odd pages as well and it's just you know the idiosyncrasies around what you need to do in the lab can actually stay in the lab really so um, one of the key points for me is knowing how many casualties you're likely to at what level you are likely to get arrive is really important so we're a large teaching hospital in 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 Oxford and we can receive up to 30 P1 and P2 patients so that's actually quite a lot you know a lot of them are needing blood products yet our small district general up in Banbury the heart and actually will only admit patients who are P3 so my major incident plan covers both aspects really the large teaching hospital aspects where people you know we potentially are going to need a lot of blood but equally it also covers you know the impact on the small district general laboratory as well so uh, in my in my eyes you want to keep your plan as simple as possible don't try and cover every possible event you're never going to do it because you'll always get something come up that you never even thought about stick to principles not stock stick uh and again you know talk to your uh trust emergency planning officer they'll they'll proofread and to me they're really helpful and it's actually really good that they know who you are so <laughs> i will actually put a, put a thing in deliberately go talk to them because actually that means they know who you are and that actually helps them as well as us and the other key thing is make sure your staff know the plan we've um uh in our uh, we use ipassport for uh, our paperwork control a lot of you will probably use uh, other systems but in that i've actually got a competency test around knowing what the plan says and you know what you're expected to do it's a very simple uh, test and i update it every year so it's just so that the people my staff know that what's in that plan and that I, I can check that they've read it in that way and it works really well just doing it. it's very simple mcqs we'll be honest with that it's very simple uh but it does work uh, next slide please facts what what should it consist of an introduction on what a major incident is uh, you know, for lab staff, if they're fairly new to the role, they, you know, some people never encounter one in their whole uh, working life. But, you know, new to the role, they may not even really appreciate what a major incident mass casualty event's about. So put a little bit of an introduction. You need to uh, make sure that they know how this lab will be informed because they potentially might be the only one here when it happens. And then some immediate actions. Who to tell? 
how to decide if you want to call additional staff in, checking your blood stocks, checking your other supplies, because it's obviously not only about blood stocks, and the provision of emergency stock. So thanks, Pat. So once patients arrive, um, the principle of handling requests is actually all I covered in my plan. I didn't, you know, it, it will depend very much on how many patients you've got in and their severity. So if you've just got one or two patients, actually, you probably want to handle them on an individual basics, basis by one or two staff. So one staff taking patient one, one staff patient taking patient two, like you would if you were doing uh, MHP. Uh, that way, you actually you can carry on getting all your routine work done, and it's you know it's it just it's less confusing if there's a small number of patients for just a couple of individuals to be doing it. But if you get massive numbers of patients in, many patients in, you might want to decide to have a process in line. So in that way, you might have somebody requesting the samples, somebody loading the analyzer, somebody issuing red cells, somebody throwing cryo FFP, somebody fating blood. You know, there's all sorts of things you can, you, you can, you know, you can decide yourself how many patient people you need in and what they're doing. And and we've used that here and I used it when where I worked previously. And actually that worked quite well. And it, so, so that's another way of doing it. But you can't say at the beginning of a major incident, unless you know how many, staff, how many patients you're going to get, which way you want to do it. So it's quite a key thing to think about what you might do and have it in a policy. My, my, I'm very happy to share my policy if anybody wants to read it. It's not exciting. But anyway, next slide, please, Fats. So staffing. There will be an immediate... Um, want to think oh I'm gonna to have to call all my staff in this is if they're out of hours obviously within work you've probably got plenty of staff in anyway but don't immediately call all your staff in that is not what you want to do there will be too many people in the lab you will uh, uh, as Chris said actually you're then you're then spending time like making sure everybody knows what they're doing rather than actually getting on with the work so actually you know it's better to have a small number of staff who are well organized and know what they're doing rather than have too many people in all wanting to help and um you've got to also remember that instant impact may go on to additional shifts to days so actually having a um having some fresh staff available at home who can come in when your staff who are in and working are exhausted tired um, is great because it means that you can actually then have a planned changeover of shift in a more uh, useful manner which is really helpful uh, next slide please uh, Fats so red cell stock. I um, th this um, <laughs> this presentation is a lot of don't do this. I think, but anyway, <laughs> please don't be tempted to order in huge numbers of red cells. <laughs> That's not what you want. <laughs> you don't want huge numbers of red cells because you'll end up eventually throwing some of them away, and you really, really don't want to do that. So. Uh, again, stop, consider what type of incident you're dealing with, how many patients you've got coming in, the severity of the patients. Uh, so um, if you're only expecting 20 P3 patients, you probably your normal stock level is absolutely fine. You probably don't even want to even think about doing anything else. Uh, but if you're then expecting 20 P1 patients coming in, you probably might need some additional stock. So you might want to make a request to actually... Uh, get some additional stock coming up. Now, here in Oxford, I'm extremely lucky. I can wave at my transfusion centre out of my window, uh, which all of the rest of you are probably not as quite as lucky as that. So you do need to factor in some transport time for those who need to. Uh, you've also got to remember that some patients may only need red cells when they get to theatre, and that will be cross-matched units. So you do need to get a whole mix of blood, blood groups. You can't only order own egg or opage you do need a mix across the board because your patients will be a mix and um i'm sure you've heard this figure before i'm sure it's not the first time this has come up today i wasn't able to join this morning but uh, the average number of red cells per patient in a major incident is actually quite low it's three per p1 casualty so yeah if you've got 20 p1s yeah that is 60 units but it's not 260 units and you know if you've got p3s it's probably none so you know actually don't over order try and if because you've also got to remember depending on where you are if you're particularly in london there may be other centers close to you who use the same uh transfusion service 
who actually are also getting casualties from this event and therefore they might be also calling on that stock. And one of the key people to um, tell when you get a major incident call is NHSBT. It's it's one of the first on our list to remember to call them and to tell them that we've got a major incident and this is what's expected. They'll probably want more details than you've got, but you can give them what you can. But um, yeah, it's it's like try and resist ordering lots is my is my key there. Uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, so cryo. So uh, for me, I keep a stock a pre-thawed FFP in the laboratory and have done for many years. But if you're expecting some P1 patients, I would recommend thawing some FFP uh, so that you've got some available when patients start arriving. When you, you know, So when you've had the call, thaw some out. You don't actually, you could even just go for four or eight and actually have them ready in your fridge so that when somebody comes in and is desperately needed some FFP, you've got something you can issue really quickly and it's going to make those MHP packs going down to theatre and to A&E really, really quickly. Um, I am going to recommend that you use Group A, as we are always recommending these these days for emergency stock FFP, uh, because, you know, it's absolutely fine to use A as emergency stock FFP. And so reserve those ABs for those who need it. So I would recommend not pre thawing cryoprecipitate just because of the short shelf life post thaw. Um, you, you, you know, once you get a feel that you've got quite a lot of bleeding going on, yes, you probably do want to thaw some at that point, but I wouldn't pre-thaw some before the patients start arriving. Uh, next slide, please, Fats. So um, platelets, um, this depends very much on what you already carry. If you're a trauma centre, you probably already carry uh, one or two platelets of stock or potentially more. But if you haven't got any in stock, I would recommend it's probably a, a, a useful tool to order some to come in just so that you've got some in. Uh, please remember, they don't need to all be a negative uh, because even if you have to give an A pause or an O pause platelet to uh, a woman, a patient who's uh, got childbearing potential and their RH neg, uh, you can always cover the the um, administration of those D pause platelets uh, with some anti-D. I know it's not ideal, but we, you know we couldn't. We're not going to have enough A neg platelets around the country to make sure to, for every you know say 20 patients who are all not necessarily going to have a blood group to be able to have an A neg platelet. So I think we've got to actually have that as a capacity. And actually, that is actually mentioned in my major incident plan about having anti D, making sure anti D is available. So if we do need to do that, we can do so quickly and easily. And an A and E, as long as you tell them why you why you've issued it, uh, absolutely happy to do so. Uh, next slide, please, Fats. Uh, so. Um, I don't know quite what that title meant. Other no major incident. Oh, don't forget your other uh, non-major incident patients. You are going to have them around in your trust. And, you know, uh, despite what Chris says, obviously, you're not going to be able to send all of them away. Um, again, it's actually it may depend on the size of the incident. You may be able to carry on processing other patient requests as you uh, as you get them, you may not. Depends on the size of the instrument. Uh, we have it is talk to the operational hospital operational leads to inform wards if you can't provide routine support for non-bleeding patients. Obviously, we'll always try and supply support for bleeding patients. Uh, remember that obstetrics, you're probably going to need to carry on providing support for as you need to because they really can't wait. Uh, but, you know, somebody sitting on a ward waiting for a top up. Yeah, actually wait in a few hours while you've got time to provide the blood it, yeah it's probably not ideal but it, you know it isn't it is acceptable in these circumstances i recommend having uh, the most senior member of staff you've got in the department on the phones because that way when you get requests and um people demanding routine work and you know you can't manage it you can actually you know you've got somebody senior saying no sorting it out uh, i think at one point we've actually uh, suggested that the um, consultant mans the phones and i actually said i don't think that's a good idea because i think actually they've got they're better used somewhere else but so um, um the other thing you can do for your blood stocks is remember that if you've got blood issued for patients going for routine surgery, that then isn't going to happen because theatres are going to be tied up dealing with all the um, major incident patients. Um, that you actually can bring their blood back to stock and reuse it if you need to. I wouldn't bring obstetrics back, but I would bring the others back. Uh, next, please, Pat's. 
And then staff. Um, staff are, you know, they, they're your asset. They're really, really important. So you do need to encourage them to take a short break. They won't want to because they'll feel that, like, they, they actually, they're involved, they're really busy. But actually having even five or ten minutes to go to the loo is really, really important. So encourage them to have a short break. Go get a drink when they can. Make sure they do get an opportunity to eat and drink. You know, these these episodes can last you know, quite a long period of time. I was involved in one when I worked in London that went on for 14 hours. And yeah, we did have to swap shifts halfway through because people were absolutely exhausted. And but getting some having an opportunity to sit down for five minutes, have something to eat, it really helps. Be prepared as you as you need to to call the staff in to take to take over as they need to. And don't forget if you're sending staff home late at night and they're leaving your hospital late at night, check that they've got a way of getting home. We've got quite a lot of our junior staff here in Oxford take the bus home or walk home. You don't really want them to be walking home at three in the morning. You know, it's not, you know, it's not great. You know, we, we've got a policy that we would, in a major incident, if they're out to read really late, we will get them taxi and send them home that way. But just make sure that your staff can get home. It's, it's not a really silly thing to do, but it actually it's really important and they do really appreciate it. Uh, next slide, please, Pat, Pats. So comms. Comms is, we all know that phones are going to be absolutely manic and it will take a while before the, go the wards get the message about the major incident. Um, I don't know about what other people have found, but um, uh, I find that even if comms goes out on email, wards don't tend to read their emails very quickly. And I can understand totally and utterly why the nurses are always really busy. So they may not get the message that there's a major incident going on. They may not realise that we're not actually going to be able to provide them a routine service some may not even realize that uh, a major incident impacts the laboratory i have had that in the past um some will also consider their patients are the most important in the trust so you might have to argue about them but you can if you get issues with people being really insistent you can get your trust operational leads to to help you you can call on your um hematology consultants uh, if needed you know don't you know explain people will understand eventually it might just take them a while sometimes if it's just one patient it's sometimes just easier if it's an electronic issue to just issue it <laughs> I, will, I will be honest with that as i said before use the senior member staff to man the phones it definitely means that most issues and most things can be sorted very quickly without anybody having to go to somebody else and saying oh what do i tell them about this if you've got a senior member of staff sitting there on the phones they can just deal with them make a note pass it on to everybody else it works really well that way and uh, for communicating catering with staff at home um, consider using a whatsapp text messaging system we use whatsapp in uh, in oxford we've got two groups we've got a social group for the staff things that people put on whatsapp but we also have a um a work group uh, for all the BMS staff uh, on WhatsApp, which we actually would use in a major incident. Uh, we haven't actually had one since we've had that major, in, uh, that WhatsApp group, touch wood, we don't get one. Uh, but it, it is really a great way of getting some quick communications out there to the staff and people will WhatsApp in saying, you know, does anybody need any help and things like that. And you, it means that they're not having to ring you, which actually, if you've not got time to answer the phone or the phone's ringing and you're too busy, it, it actually it's a really useful tool because you can ignore them if you're really busy. Uh, the other thing to make sure that your staff are aware of, beware to not put anything on social media just so um, just so that actually, you know, nobody contravenes any rules. Uh, it's something that I always make sure that my junior staff are aware of around social media. It's something we do in induction, but we do reiterate it. If we have a major incident, we wouldn't. Uh, we would just make sure people were aware of that. Next, please. So stand down. Uh, most people uh, will tell you that they stood down. ED are very good at remembering to tell you that they've stood down. But you need to remember to tell the people you told that you were getting involved in a major incident and about being stood up. That they've, they've also been stood down. So that includes NHSBT, the consultant, your senior in haematology. We usually go around and tell haematology. Uh, but Remember, for labs, the stand down isn't the end. Patients will be going to theatre, as Chris said, they may not be going to theatre for a day or two, maybe more. Critical care will be at full capacity almost certainly, so you'll be providing products for them all the time. You will need to catch up on any of your delayed 
uh, routine requests. So, you know, it's actually, there's quite a lot goes on post a stand down, but um, it, it does actually mean you do know when you've got stand down that you've got time, you can breathe, you, you know you're not getting any new patients in who are going to need lots of blood very, very quickly, and you can take your time as they're going through and people get things done properly, which is great. And next slide, please, Fats. So uh, don't forget traceability uh, and documentations of your uh, blood transfusions. In Oxford, as most people know, we use, uh, we use uh, an electronic uh, blood transfusion management system, and that works really well uh, in, in ED. And ED actually use that to record all their, their paperwork very quickly because they soon cottoned on that that was the quickest way of actually doing it, and it was far easier than trying to write. And as Chris said, what we do with our patients who they then name, so we have major incident packs already... Um, already provided ready up in in ed and when we then know the name of the patient they wait until they're not going to need to go to theater or they're not needing any blood products before they actually change the identification wristband on the patient and that is what that's worked very well through all our unknown patients as they come in and um it's just, you know, actually, that's one of the things you can get your emergency planning officer to, to liaise with. It works really, really well. So um, next slide, please, Fats. So the debrief. Uh, as Chris also mentioned, you do need to think about how did it go. You, it is a good idea to hold a quick debrief, uh, you know, before people go home or as things begin to calm down. Just like, or even just to remind people to make a note of what they think went really well, what we could have done better, uh, what issues we need to look at urgently for next time. Um, you know, things like that. And just our people feeling, are they OK? Can they get home? <laughs> things like that is really you know they, we can't stress them enough I'm sure you've heard it lots of times today make look after your staff they're so important to you um try and attend the hospital debrief labs should be invited but if they're not <laughs> I would say attend anyway <laughs> they always invite us now because they're used to me just going don't forget us uh but you know it will be publicized when the then the hospital formal debrief is happening attend even if you're not invited just go they don't they, they usually never mind and it is important actually if you've got some issues around patient sample labeling or things like that to actually feed those issues in because you know, they all had to the trust overall performance in the major incident. And don't forget, forget to feed in any positive feedback that you've got, because that's equally as important. I think we all spend a lot of time moaning about when things didn't go exactly right. But actually putting in some positive feedback is really also important. So next slide, please. That, that's, I think that's at the end. Yeah, so we've now got a little. V There's a couple of VBox questions for you, so I'm I'm um, I'm sure you've done this earlier on today. So this is the session number. So we'll move on to the first question. Yeah. So, um, the first question. To... Yeah. Brilliant. We've got 62 people who've entered. Oh, that's so good. Th there is a timer. It's set for one minute. So we're now uh, on 49 seconds. <laughs> yes. So once the minute is up, you should see all the results. But it's good that people are putting in things already that we can see. Excellent. We had a few yeah, problems really with this good. earlier on, but oh, okay. it's, working, it's working really well. That's good. It's looking really good. Got a lot of a, a nice lot of answers. Yeah, lots of people put it in the lab, but it's important to know where in the lab, what shelf, what folder, um, particularly if it's amongst a bunch of folders in on on a shelf. We've we've got two. We've got one on a folder, and we've got a box of stuff like extra tubes, extra pastettes, extra pipette tips, and we've actually got a copy in there too, <laughs> because that way really? we know we can all find it. <laughs> so that's so good. Quite a lot of. Um, quite a lot of different answers um i think the reason why i've got a printed out copy i don't print out many sops i'm a bit anti-printing because i'm a bit of a green fiend and um but the one thing that i do the reason i do have it printed out is you just never know people are not going to time necessarily to go to qpults or ipassport to look for it in that time so that's why i have a printed out copy it's just easier than it's easy and available so that's good 
You're, ex- you're receiving P1 casualties. How many red cells do you think you're going to need per patient? Now, I did tell you this in my presentation, so hopefully. <laughs> you did indeed. And as you can see, I've set it up dynamically so that people can see what other people are putting in and then change their minds if they want to. Um, you've got that option. So, so uh, go on, Bats. Now, there you go, you get the little tick. The... Yeah, well done. Shows that people were listening to my presentation because virtually everybody got it right, which is great. 